Hello, welcome to today's video. We are continuing with our coverage of the 2020 Kumasi Chess Classics Invitational. Uh, so far, we've had a, a very exciting tournament. We are currently in the round of 16. And like you can see on the graphic, there somewhere, um, we are following the match between Bernard Andre, sporting user named Yamiba against Robert Saki or Robbie Lex. So the time is up for the match to begin, so it's be, to start uh, momentarily. Just a bit of a preview. So um, Ben is the second seed. He, he started off with a very high rating. And so, of course, he's one of the, the favorites to go all the way and win it all. Um, his first round, though, was, was won by forfeit. So he's yet to actually play any chess. And this is the first round that he'll be playing. Raz Roberts uh, had a very good first round. He won, um, I think, 13-10 against um, one of the K University players. Unless I'm mistaken, I think it was uh, Smart, Daniel Fripon Smart. And yeah, it was a very exciting game. Like the scoreline suggests, he went quite far, but then he came out on top. He's, he's experienced, that's for sure. And he's more used to the online uh, setting than perhaps some of the other some of the other older participants so yeah the match will be close will be interesting why well, I, I can't say that it will be close we've had a an interesting phenomenon where the, the round of 16 um, so far at least all the rounds that have been played have been have been very one-sided indeed even very surprising very surprisingly so so we hope this one is a close one and doesn't follow suit uh, so we we wait for them to begin the match And we are off. So this is the first game, five plus three time control. Uh, that will be worth four points. Ben starts on the white side and starts out with one d4. He likes going for these Catalan structures. Sometimes he also plays a QGD. So we'll see which one he goes for here. Uh, yeah, with the double knight coming out, maybe he goes e3, maybe he doesn't. E3 or no e3? Okay, he goes e3. So we'll be seeing a, a normal QGD structure. Meanwhile, Mr. Mr. Saki has uh, gone for a KID formation, a King's Indian formation here. Uh, ben has expanded in the center with E4. But then you could argue that uh, he, he wasted a tempo with E3 earlier on. He was going to play for anyways. But probably that tempo won't mean all that much. Uh, so Robert is continuing. They're playing very quickly, by the way. He's continuing the typical fashion, expanding on the queen side here in the KID. Ben is also continuing with grabbing some space over there on the, on the queen side. It looks... I'm not sure who exactly this structure in the middle favors. Currently, I'm inclined to say it favors white. Or maybe not. It just seems like white is, has gone, has progressed very much with his idea of uh, attacking on the queen side. Whereas black hasn't really gotten started. I expected something like knight h5 and f5 to continue with this king side attack. So that's really... The idea of the, the whole opening, right? You you basically give up the center and you intend to block it up and then attack on the king side. Uh, he has managed to block it up, but then the attack on the king side hasn't quite started yet. Maybe with h6, he's planning to, to do just that with uh, with knight h5 and f5. Maybe knight d7. I mean, knight somewhere in f5. h6 typically is played when there's a knight on f3 to stop the knight from hopping into g g5 when you do play f5 so maybe h6 wasn't necessary here maybe he, he's just planning to bring his other knight in here and he doesn't want to play f5 at all which would be surprising but okay we'll see how the game continues so yeah white controls a lot more space for now yeah he's bringing the other knight into g5 so maybe f5 is not on his mind at all okay now he's played knight h5 so <laughs> h5 maybe is still coming or maybe he just wants to go knight f4 um yeah i probably have to give up trying to guess these moves because uh, i'm not doing so well thus far but the, they're, they're playing quite quickly i mean neither neither players used up to 20 seconds on their clock and they're already well into the middle game they're playing very quickly indeed um i'm still not sure about the evaluation of the position with the last four or five or so moves i'm fairly certain they're favoring black um <laughs> Just as I said that, black fell into a, a fork. Okay, so yeah, black is going down, but you are going down an exchange. But then he has these very nice knights to try and draw up some counterplay. 
but because the queens are off it will be very difficult to get a powerful enough kingside attack going to make up for the fact that you are down material so this will be tough for for black to hold for sure and white maybe is already winning he only needs to solve the problem of these knights um you can try king h2 and g3 that looks like it works there might be other things okay but ben is breaking over here on the queen side with a5 so they'll come off i'm not I'm not sure about that move um i thought the pawn over there on b6 was quite weak so i'll prefer to just leave it there play your double key and try and put some pressure on it but uh, he went for the, the liquidation option because now okay i guess you're going to attack the weak d6 man you already have material so you don't really need much of an attack you just need to neutralize black's attack here on the on the king side but the reason why i didn't like the the whole operation with the a5 is that if queens were still on the board then black would definitely have had enough counter because now there's not much going on on the queen side and he still has what seems to be a significant attack going on on the king side but even if, even as i say that uh yeah, he's, he's backing up his pieces from the king side and now it looks like the queen side is becoming more important so i i think ben will really in this first point which will be quite crucial i mean i'm not sure exactly how um mr robert would approach this particular match on paper he's of course the underdog the difference in their rating is about 2200 um, 200 points online so he would need to come up with some sort of strategy to hold them because he's not faster than ben and objectively probably he's not stronger than ben either and not more experienced in the online format so it's very tough to find where you would find you you'd get your you'd get your points from but okay he has played very quickly though i mean they're both playing quickly but he's 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 only used 30 seconds on the clock which is I mean, we've played the whole game. We've played 36 moves. If you can do that in 30 seconds, he probably is a beast at a time control like 2 plus 1. But here he's just dropping stuff. Bishop f5. And, uh, yeah, this guy's attacked. I'm asleep today. So you check somewhere. He just moves the rook away. Yeah. It doesn't look like Black has anything close to compensation yet. I do fully expect uh, expect white to win in the point. So the knight is kicked has to go away somewhere. Maybe it goes back to yeah. But then then you can take this pawn. You can push that pawn. Many things are winning. So he takes the pawn on f5. The knight comes to f4. And basically, what went wrong for black here is that uh, he didn't really play in the spirit of the opening. Right? When you play a king's Indian, you are giving up the center and to some extent the queen side and you don't try to fight back in those areas of the of the board you basically go for a king side attack i mean in most of the variations anyways and uh you try and get counterplay there and argue that that is more important than the queen side play and many times you can do that successfully but what black did in this particular game was a, a little strange in the beginning he played a lot on the queen side and white already got a a fairly significant advantage on the queen side before he started playing for the king side attack with knight h5 and f5 and already was a bit late but even after he started down that route exchanging queens uh, setting was not the way to go and he probably just missed that he was losing an exchange uh, even though for that maybe he could still have photon but that coupled with the queen exchange really really shot him in the foot so yeah this game is just done and uh We'll see how Ben finishes it off. So maybe something like Bishop D5 to force the knights to E8 and also dominate it. But he doesn't go for it. Oh, but now Bishop D5 just wins the piece. That would be all she wrote. You could even take with the bishop and still hold the pawn. But that would be a bit too sadistic, maybe. Yeah, so white is up here. Rook and two pawns. And again, barring something very very cataclysmic we, we expect this game to yeah ben just takes the bishop to simplify things he's going to push his pawns the king can come up and take all these pawns if he wants to i mean there's no point analyzing the position itself anymore 
So the match situation is is interesting. I mean, Ben has started well. Winning these at least one of the first two games is probably one of the most important parts of these matches because we've, we've seen a lot of the matches not go into bullet at all. We actually only had a handful that have gone to bullet. So it seems that getting a a good score in this first round, especially this first round of five plus three, um, yeah, most of the times with the opponents under too too much pressure to come back in the blitz portion. So yeah, getting the getting on the scoreboard in the first game is a sure way to avoid any upsets in this match. And again, this is the round of sixteen. I'm not sure if I mentioned it already. But uh, all the winners in this round will be guaranteed a part of the prize fund. So they are, they are literally playing for the money here. So uh, that makes these particular games a little more a little more interesting and spicy. Wow, well, but Robert is really playing, playing to the end. And he's so fast. He's still not used up to a minute on the match. Quick. I mean, he gets three second increments per move, but uh, to not have used a minute at move 62 in a game when you have five minutes probably makes me think i mean you may have uh, you may have taken some time there in the middle game to invest to invest into some 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 calculating because especially to lose a game on which you have four minutes left it doesn't make all that much sense but then again i'm i'm the one who always uh who always goes into time trouble and loses on time so probably not the guy to listen to for advice when it comes to managing time yeah, he's praying for some sort of stalemate, but not at this level, I don't think. You can even queen and he has to take this pawn and then you'll mate him one. But okay, he queens there first and then he'll queen here. And it's also mating one on g8. Oh. Or mating two from g6. So yeah, that's the first match, first game in the back. 4.2 to Ben. Now we look forward to the second game, where now Robert is in... This precarious situation where he, he really really needs to win because going into the blitz section down four or eight points really really puts a lot of strain I don't think we've seen anyone come back from a deficit in the first portion um, with the exception of one mr. Paul senior guy I think in his first match he might have come back I'm not entirely sure but I think he came back from a from a, a four-point deficit in the first section he won a lot of the the blitz and bullet games but it's very tough generally so you, you really want to go in into the blitz section at least level and then you can hope for i mean in something like bullet anything can happen then it doesn't really matter if you're at the underdog but to go in there with a point of it to really put a lot of stress on and perhaps the the stress it puts on your brain is even more more important than the stress it puts on your than, I mean on your objective playing ability because when you have that feeling that you have to win those games then you're actually more likely to make the exact mistakes that will lose you the game so we have a another opening here actually completely blanked when they were playing so okay so he went for a, a very modest uh, double fianchetto setup and Ben set up with a sort of a reverse good felt we have actually a very interesting position here. Looks strategically rich. There's, there's a lot of things going on. So first of white has the bishop pair, and black does not. Um, black willingly gave it up over here on f3 before he pushed here in the center. So probably wants to close the position up to make his his uh, minor piece count. Oh, and white just dropped a piece. That's unfortunate. So after knight h4, knight h4, the knight only had one square left. Queen d6 protected the one square, and he missed the idea completely and fell for b5. And now the knight is trapped, and has to give itself up for a pawn over here on, on c5. That is not how you want to start a must-win game. That is for sure. But okay, you do get a couple of pawns for it. You take on d5 with the bishop, maybe with the bishop because the knight is pinned to this guy. Oh, but he took. Oh, e2. He missed e2. Yeah, so Ben will win the second game as well. He's tactically just very, very sharp. Much sharper than his opponent today, it seems. So he's up a queen for a rook. He's up a queen for a rook, and he has an extra minor piece. Yeah, that is. 
it's looking less and less likely that we'll have a close match like we would hope this might end up being another one of the another one of the white watches which is which is interesting because I, I don't think we had as many rollovers in the run of 32 which is where you actually expect a lot more of these but this run of 16 has been bloody I mean whether it's the the fact that they are playing for prizes now or maybe people are just being paired against people they are that are much stronger than them because I mean fixtures that look like they really should be close have not been at all we've not had a single match go to bulletin in this round of 16 and i think the highest score we've had is three for the losing side and that's just been one one match every other match has been 14-0 so we hope that changes at least for the for the spectatorship the more exciting games are what you want for sure Okay, so the knight has taken on d4, white may double, black is going to play e5 and ask you how you are getting rid of that piece. Yeah, this is just completely, completely lost. So Ben will go into the... Oh, also, don't forget our myth threats. Queen h1 is a huge major threat, which I would have fallen for. Ben will go into the blitz section with, uh, with an 8-point lead. So he avoids the mate with this. Um, but then he has stuff, right? Bishop h6. Yeah, queen here and then bishop h6. No, Ben is Ben is on point. <laughs> ben is on point to the end. Yeah, this this match might not last as long as we wish. He's not missing anything. Yeah, so he even sucks the queen, he's going to win the rook. And uh, he's going to be up a rook and a minor piece against a lone piece and a king it's going to sweep up some pawns again there's not much to analyze here is that this is just oh, he even takes the piece for free no this is resignable okay so ben has an eight point lead going into the blitz section and uh, he's making the match seem I don't say easy it's it's really more been blunders from from robert's side and I mean, of course, there, there are no there are no easy games without blunders. But then he's really showing the difference between the nineteen hundred and the twenty one hundred, at least online. But okay, we are done with the five plus three games now. Ben wins both of them. We're going to the three plus three games next, and Robert will really have to make a mark and do do it quickly in this section if he intends to come back from this particular deficit. Okay, so we are off in the 3 plus 2 section. The first game, Ben has white once again, and he goes d4 again. And uh, Robert goes for another King's Indian type structure. This time he, he, he goes with d6, but still goes for the double fianchetto. He plays a similar system with white as well, I guess. So it, it kind of gives him the flexibility to play structures that he's familiar with, which is really what you want to do in 3 plus 2. Um, or even in bullets because you really want to play the open as quickly and as accurately as possible ah okay so this is i believe what they call the hippo unless i'm mistaken where you do this double fianchetto pawns on d6 and e6 and knights here and here um yeah okay it's it, it has an interesting reputation i mean of course it's not the best obviously but it's also not the easiest opening to break down so ben goes for the e5 break uh, takes takes the prized bishop on g2 has been exchanged off. Black retains this bishop. Actually, kind of like Black's position out of the open. Isn't he just winning a pawn? Now, okay, you have to take back with the knight instead. No, I, I, I think Black is doing just fine. He still has to deal with this bishop here, which is the only problem. Ah, move like bishop g5 is really annoying. So the knight will come back to c3, I expect. And then he will challenge him on the, on the d file. Yeah, but then he has to no he can't play f4 so this is a problem maybe you go bishop f6 yeah he goes bishop f6 i wonder if you can no you can't take no but i think you, you do take because that pawn probably gets lost at some point you can take on f6 it's very difficult for any other piece to protect the pawn on f6 but he doesn't go for it he attempts to double rooks which probably prompts white to yeah, meet him on the d file so we just play rook here 
ah, he, there was a pawn hanging. Okay, so he goes up a pawn, but then he gives up the seventh rank. I would probably prefer to keep the seventh rank protected. I don't think that pawn is worth it. No, not even close. Yeah, now rook here is a huge threat. You have to play something like h6 or h5. Oh, that one. Yeah, but that's giving the pawn back. Yeah, so black probably regrets um, going for that pawn. Because the seventh rank is, is I mean, it's the most important rank. And if you're going to allow any piece to invade, not, not the rooks. That is always going to give you trouble. Yeah, so probably he's still going for ah he's going to double on the seventh Eesh. this is painful to watch how do you how do you defend you are definitely going to lose at least some points right your rook has to come what oh you can't allow him to take on f7 that is you're close to a mating net now i mean yeah very close to a mating net actually no this is no it's not mate just yet it's it's scarily close to mate you're actually hanging on by the A very thin line and we definitely don't allow things like this i mean yeah he goes here and then you have to come back and then you can take this pawn yeah you can go here you can even have ideas of pushing the pawn no you, you never allow double rooks on that oh now it's mate yeah that was a mating net you, you never allow double rooks on your, on your seventh on your seventh rank that is just unacceptable so ben goes up 10-0 in the match and has 2.5 points more to get to secure match victory. Yeah, Robert is uh, is having a lot of issues. Ben is playing well and he's playing quickly, and it's got to see exactly how he will come back from this deficit. So he goes for um, another King's Indian setup. He has White. That's Robert. Ben Ben also meets it with a. A similar system yeah so a theme in this match is that both players play very similar systems as both uh, as both white and black they both young keto their, their bishop so i mean this is just the flip the, the reverse of a, a catalan oh ben just dropped the piece okay so we'll just replay that moment apparently that also happens <laughs> even to the to the best of us okay so that's uh that's something positive that's something you want to see hopefully Robert can continue to really in this point. Yeah, so you have a piece, but I mean, Ben is not going to roll over, so you do need to. You do need to show something to win the game. So he's played c3 to take this d4 square away from the black knight, but then that makes the pawn on d3 a target, which, um, which Ben duly targets with a rook f8. Now the bishop goes, so you, you notice that every move, and that's one of the principles in chess, weaknesses don't just disappear. Whenever you have one weakness, you only transform it from one weakness to the other. You can't just take a weakness and take it completely out of the place, right? Now the weakness here was that this square is under black's control. You wanted to take it out of black's control, so you played d3. Now you created another weakness. There's a weak point on d3. And so you attacked it. You want to take care of that weakness, so you play bishop f1. But then you create another weakness on this diagonal. And then he duly attacks. So every move that you make to try and fix a weakness really only creates a weakness somewhere else. When you understand that principle about weakness, it's very easy to find the attacking moves because you always look at what they've left behind, right? They've they've gone ahead in the game, so we'll quickly catch up. So queen e2 was played. B5, nice. Queen d4 going for a queen exchange, queen d6, rejecting it. The bishop came back to g2, but then the pawn is hanging on d3, so Ben took it. Uh, I think the idea is that this knight is also hanging, but he did not take the knight. No, is there something? Oh no, no, the knight is not hanging. Listen to me. Um, so yeah, the exchange happened on d3. So Ben has won the pawn back for the piece. Um, he sacrificed another pawn to break through on the on the queen side, but then White decided to push b4 instead of take the pawn back. Now he's attacking that structure with a5. So now he has a passed pawn. And whenever he pushes, he has this extra stuff on this rook. He definitely has a lot of counterplay for the for the pawn that he's, he's uh, for the piece that he he dropped for nothing. So this this will be an interesting uh, an interesting ending. Yeah, I thought maybe you want to play c2 uh, earlier on so that you get this moving with the tempo because c2 is definitely going to play this. 
but now you could have okay you don't have that square but you could have placed something like bishop here hitting that guy and taking some points but okay so he takes there and then he attacks the pawn on b4 now this is far from easy although this knight's position is also very precarious okay he plays with key 4 to hold the pawn down Yeah, it's not simple, right? You're you still up a piece, but it's not uh, simple to see how you win here as uh, as white. Bishop h6, hitting that rook, forcing it seemingly to c2. That's that's a very interesting move. He could even put the bishop over here on d2 to hold the pawn down further. And then this rook could have ideas of swinging over here or here. No, white, uh, black is definitely kicking. He has ideas still. And white needs to do some good accurate defending here to, to maintain the advantage. So I expect rook c2. I mean, if the rook leaves, yeah, rook c2 on the board. Now what do you play? The ideas of check here, forcing the bishop to f1. If you had a light square bishop, then you could set up some sort of mate, but you don't. Um, so maybe then you try and bring this guy around. Yeah, he's going for it. Check. You don't even force bishop f1 because the d1 square is under his control. But okay, he doesn't go for that. And now do you try and bring this guy around or... Probably too slow, yeah. Well, he's trying it because he gives up this pawn. So you better make sure that you are, you are indeed mating him. And I don't, I'm not sure that you are mating him. So probably there will be something wrong with this move. I think it's a bit too slow. I'm not sure exactly what is wrong with it. Maybe you start with king g2. Maybe that's the way. It feels like it should be too slow. Okay, he goes the safe route and plays with the rookie one. Uh, forcing that exchange, basically. But now after this, isn't that a, a double attack? You really do not want to play something like this. No, the, the guy is defended. No, I'm, I'm, my, my tactics are horrible today, pardon me. Okay, so he holds the pawn on, on c3. Now the king moves out of danger. Okay, now it feels like the brunt of the attack is over and uh, Robert should be able to convert the point from here. It's still a little tricky. I mean, there's still a pawn on c3, but... Oh, but that's just a dropped piece. That, that will be game over. Take the piece, yay. So Ben dropped two pieces in a game. That's... That is rare. Okay, so white white wins this one comfortably, and at least gets onto the the scoreboard. So the score will be ten two after this game. Um, if I be so bold as to call it, and then we'll have three, uh, two blitz games to go. So Ben will have to win both of them to win the match in, in the blitz section. The chances of a comeback are still very very slim. Robert would have to win 10 points. He would have to win at least one of the, the two blitz games left and all the eight blitz games. I mean that's how huge a task uh, he has facing him. But again stranger things have happened on the chessboard. Okay so Ben drops a third piece. I think he's Combine all the blunders that he's going to <laughs> commit in this match into one game. I mean, three dropped pieces in a game is a bit is a bit much. Okay, so we go to the third blitz, uh, the third three plus two game here. Ben is black on the uh, back on the white side, and he starts out with one e4 this time, deviating from his usually trusted d4. And of course, he's a very good player. He can play either either opening uh, very well. So we we look forward to. Robert's response. He's favored these uh, Kings Indian are, and he goes g6 for the modern defense. Yeah, and it's good to maybe it's good to play systems like this for for blitz. They do kind of make you a target for classical chess, but in blitz chess you get to play the opening quickly, and you play positions you're experienced in, which which is a plus. So okay, Ben's, Ben goes for the e4 d4 setup with the c3, setting up a pawn chain just to blunt the bishop over here on g7. And it seems that he's going for another hippo 
hypotype position. Yeah, exactly what it's going for is black. Okay, so knight bd2 is the kind of position where white will always be slightly better, if for nothing at all, because of the space that he enjoys in the center. Right, his pawns are on the fourth, and uh, you have a similar pawn duo of the d and e pawn, but they are on the third rank for you as black. So white will always enjoy more space, and more space comes with better squares. So he's going to have nine squares for his pieces, and you might have to struggle. Right, for example, these two knights right now need to figure out what they are going to do with their lives because it's not clear which squares. Uh, are available to them but he starts lashing out with f5 i don't know all too much about these kinds of positions but it looks like f5 weakens that diagonal which man immediately attempts to seize with queen b3 so okay he's forced to push d5 but now that blunts your second bishop this guy is already already planted so now your position doesn't look all that well well crafted because if your two bishops aren't doing all that much, then... So Ben makes a very interesting decision here. He could have taken with the knight, but he decided to give up the bishop pair and rather play with the two knights against the two bishops. Which is something that you do when you have... You can do when you have blood centers like this. In this particular position, I'm not sure that he was the best. Uh, just because that knight does not look to me like he has a lot of prospects either. He probably will have to come back to remaneuver itself somewhere else. So, yeah, maybe, probably... Not the worst position in the world to give the knight up, but either ways, we still do have a position to play. So he's going for bishop f4, he wants maybe to uh, plant a piece on d5 to oppose this guy. Yeah, so he exchanges on e8, and then he's going to win temporary control of the e file with rook e1. So I expect rook e1 first, and then some piece into d5 maybe. Ricky 1 maybe white goes, uh, black goes queen f8 to prepare just Ricky 8 to fight. Oh, there was a pawn hanging on c7, I completely missed that. So he just steals a pawn for nothing. That is a shame. Now Ricky 1 comes with tempo. Yeah, dropped, uh, dropped pawns and pieces like that at this level can be, can be fatal. So bishop e5 here to oppose that guy. And the d5 square is really what they are fighting for now, right? White really wants to put a piece there. And black recognizes that white putting a piece there probably will mean the end of the game because that square is so strong. And currently is the best square on the board to fight for, yeah. So he exchanges all the pieces and leaves a rook there. A rook is not the strongest piece on, on such an output square, so. Maybe you play rook e8 here and neutralize that rook. But the problem is you are down a pawn. And yeah, you always be struggling in that end game. King safety is a slight issue for black also, but in this particular position, uh, because white queen is so far away, it's not it's not clear exactly how that king will be in danger anytime soon. But that could easily become a become a factor later. So he goes for rook c7 instead. I'm not sure if there was something wrong with here. Maybe I missed something. Because if uh, if not, I don't know what's the point of rook c7. Because I'm sure the point of rook c7 is to go rook e7. But if you are going to oppose that rook, why not do it straight away? If there was some some detail I missed. But okay, the game goes on. So white, how does white continue? So white goes queen b4, controlling that e7 square, not allowing him to play rook e7. Now what do you do as black? Bishop a6. Mm. Not sure where the bishop is headed. But it definitely didn't have any future on this diagonal. And this diagonal is completely blocked. So that's the only diagonal that there isn't really any hope for it. So yeah. That is where it goes. So the queen has attempted to invade with d7, protecting the d5 pawn. Maybe you just go queen here and go for an exchange. You know, he attempts to attack stuff. But it's not really attacking anything, is it? I mean, that pawn is very well protected. Maybe he's planning to go rook e8 and then go for some sort of attack on the king. I would have just gone for a queen exchange. I mean, we are pawned up... No need to complicate things further. So yeah, Robert goes rook e7 to stop any such ideas. So probably the rooks will come off f4, a good move. Uh, really holding that square down. And saying, yeah, come at me, come and take. Because whenever it is that you take, you are going to create a passed pawn. And an extra pawn is already advantage enough. A passed extra pawn probably will be decisive in many, many end games. So black really has a, a 
a huge task ahead to hold this particular game. Queen d6 on the board, rook d7, not going in for the exchange of rooks, recognizing that after some pawn takes, that will be a very strong pass pawn for white. So he goes back rook d7. And I mean, just queen e6. He goes queen c6. He does have the more aggressive position, so maybe he wants to avoid the, the queen exchange. So the bishop plants itself on the e4 outpost, but again, the bishop doesn't do all that much on an outpost. But Ben just goes yeah out with out with that bishop and takes it off the board. Now the position is getting more and more interesting. So now black has a passed pawn on the e file, uh, but it's super weak. I mean, it's not threatening to push anytime soon. Uh, so it's not really a factor currently, but it could be at some point. But the problem with this is the king is just so close to that, it's difficult to see that pawn ever becoming relevant. So queen e6 is finally played. So now as white, you are, you are going to put your king on, on e3 to stop all of black's play. After the queens come off, I, I guess the queens will come off soon. And then you want to emphasize the fact that you have a power spawn, right? Your power spawn, I think, currently exists over here on the king side. You have a 3 on 2. So you're going to push these pawns and just create a power spawn on this king side that you're going to push. Because of this particular structure, it might even be possible to create a queen side power spawn as well for white. So you might just be winning all over the board. So this, even though it's a rook end game, and rook end games can be held a pawn down, I think this particular one is completely winning for white. Yeah, if for nothing at all, because he, he can create uh, pass pawns on both sides of the board. So, yeah, so he goes for the queen side option here. And that's the idea. Because black has this passed pawn, it means if you consider just this queen side, white has a 4 on 3. If you consider just this king side, white has a 3 on 2. And that ability to win on both sides of the board should be decisive. So he, he created a pass pawn on the d file that he's going to start working on he's going to work his king into this c5 square hits the rook starts pushing meanwhile his rook is doing such an excellent job of keeping the black king out of all the action and a king against the rook the rook i mean loses it's the rook alone cannot handle um, a king so eventually he's going to have to give itself up for this yeah you don't even need your, your rook that's the thing just your king and pawn are enough you can just push the pawn and bring your rook up and uh, bring your king up and that rook will be helpless against them. So yeah, and when you anchor the rook on this square, then you can't push the pawn anymore. So you could bring it back. Okay, he wants to um, add the rook into the attack. So he does just that. And he sweeps some more pawns. No, this is uh, completely win. Black finally gets some activity for his rook, but it's probably a bit too late now. He's already two pawns down. And white has a pass pawn on d6, supported by a king. That is all kinds of lost, of course. So you try checking him, he's going to go to d8, he's going to push the pawn to d7, and then he's going to control the file next to him and bring his king out that way. And you'll be forced to give up your. Yeah, exactly that. You'll be forced to give up your rook for the pawn. And you don't even have time to go and create a pass pawn for yourself. So I'm afraid this will be 12 0 for, for Ben. Sorry, 12 2. Forgot the the peace game. Yeah, and twelve two for Ben will mean that he only needs to get onto the score sheet one more time to win the match. So any draw or any victory in any of the games that remain, um, there will be nine games left, and Robert would have to win every single one of those nine to to tie the match. So yeah, probably. Probably this match is over. So you've had a you've had a power outage, like you can see, uh, which means my internet will disappear in a bit. We will try and reconnect as quickly as possible. I hope it doesn't affect any of the participants, though. So my face probably doesn't exist any longer. Okay, we are back online. Uh, thankfully, it seems the, their connections are still on. And uh, Ben did, of course, go on to win that game. So the score is 12-2. They are playing the the fourth game in the 3-plus-2 section. 
And once again, uh, Ben only needs to score a draw or a win in any of the games left to end the match. So we go for another Kings Indian type structure that they've played basically the whole match. And isn't Ben winning a pawn here? Probably not. No, he just is. Wow. Okay, so Robert played the move E for a bit prematurely and just dropped the pawn. We've seen a lot of this kind of careless play from quite a number of the participants, it must be said. Um, yeah, sometimes they play a bit too quickly. And uh, maybe in an effort to play a bit more on the clock, I'm not sure, but certain careless mistakes like this. Because now you have a position where you, I mean, it's a must win game for one thing, so you don't really help yourself by by giving yourself a worse position. So okay, he gives up the Fianchetto Bishop to create some doubled pawns for black and a little bit of initiative. But is it enough? Because now you've given up your most valuable piece and your other pieces really are not all that great. This guy either. So I think black is doing just fine. He's a pawn up. White has a bit of compensation for the pawn for sure. This structural uh, damage on the C file. But then again, black also has the bishop pair. So probably black is still doing better here. Just better. Ooh, and he, he dropped the tactic. A tactic over here on C3. So knight takes B2, rook takes bishop C3, fox, the two rooks. And that was Ben was so quick again in spotting that. He's putting that little uh, sequence. So yeah, he's very sharp today and yeah, if there is a day for a blunder, it doesn't look like today will be that day. He looks to be in good form and uh, you would expect that he rose in this particular match. So he's up an exchange now. Um, yeah, an exchange and a, a number of pawns. The material count is confusing me now. Okay, so he has a rook and three pawns for two pieces. Usually a rook and a pawn are what uh, make up for two pieces, but now he has two extra pawns. He just dropped one of them though on c7. Rook d5 getting some tempo on the knight. Maybe rook c8. Suck the bishop away. Maybe you go a5, a4 to ask questions of this knight. Maybe you push c5, c4. That is a passed pawn. Ah, g5 just fox pieces. Now he wins a piece back. Yeah, okay. So this match probably ends here. Yeah, Ben has just played played much better. He hasn't missed the beat. Except for the pieces game. That was a funny game. And uh Yeah, he scores a, a comfortable win. So he doubles, he doubles rooks. I, would, I mean, I would have also liked just pushing. Pass pawns must be pushed. I mean, what are the rooks going to attack? It's completely winning anyway, so who cares? So the rook is going in for some sort of exchange. You play rook c2 here, definitely, yeah. Oh, bishop f1. Ah, my goodness. That is a mating attack. Wow. Yeah, Ben is very, very sharp. I missed all of this. So yeah, that was the right way to go. My pawn pushing idea was too slow. This was just completely winning. Completely winning. So yeah, Ben wins the match. 14 points to 2. He's completely rolled over Robbie. And uh, really proved his credentials as one of the one of the favorites in this tournament. So yeah. He's one of the people to beat for sure. And uh, the next few rounds will certainly be very exciting. He's on collision course with, I think, um, Mr. Nkwanda. If he wins his next match, I think they meet in the semis. I'm not entirely sure though. But yeah, the tournament uh, is looking is looking very interesting. And we certainly look forward to the next rounds. So tomorrow we'll have three games, three matches. Um, yeah, the, I've forgotten the match soon. The details will be posted soon somewhere. But thank you very much for tuning in, uh, for watching the match, and uh, continue following the tournament. And uh, yeah, enjoy playing, watching, and doing anything chess. Happy chessing. And um, comment, subscribe if you haven't already. Wow, I just saw my face. That's a very dark outline. Okay. 
So I'm giving you a peace sign. Thank you for tuning in and goodbye.